It's been 10 years this month since I started designing gamified e-learning as a freelancer and over that time I've come to realize there are some things about this industry that people just aren't talking about enough and knowing this stuff ahead of time would have made my journey smoother. So those hard truths are what I want to share with you today. And if you're new here, well hi my name is Mary Jo and I help e-learning designers who want to break away from traditional e-learning and quickly create gamified training that makes a real world impact. So if that sounds like you, you can check out my program at the link in the description. And now here are the top 10 hard truths I've learned in 10 years of e-learning design. Number one, there's a crisis in the training industry. Every year I speak to hundreds of instructional designers who want to gamify their training and whether they're from Alabama or Africa, they all describe the same thing. Many of them feel that their training doesn't make a difference and it's just there to check a box and sometimes to annoy the learner. But these are smart, passionate, and highly trained people. And the reason why they end up making that kind of training is because they get squeezed to cover more and more content in less and less time. And they're not okay with just phoning it in. When they reach out to me, it's never because somebody else told them to up their game. Everyone's happy with the status quo, but they need to raise the bar. It's coming from them. So on the one hand, we have these great educators who are passionate about making training that solves problems. But on the other, they're stuck in a situation where they can't actually use their gifts. And I think we're all losing out from that. Learners, workers, companies, and humanity as a whole. That's depressing. But what I've also seen is that a lot of decision makers out there are looking for ways to bring their training out of the 80s. And when they're shown the way, they're often very enthusiastic and they get behind it. So we just have to get more of them in front of innovative training and that will raise the bar for all of us. Number two, academia is behind. I'm all for being evidence-based in what we do, so I always keep an eye on the research literature about gamification of training, but unfortunately, what academia is publishing about it is really behind what you'll find to be true when you're actually in the field doing it. And one of the main reasons for this is because of the way they run their meta-analyses. A meta-analysis is when you take a whole bunch of studies about a topic and you pull the data from these studies together to determine how well gamification works, for example. But to do that, you have to compare apples to apples, so they purposely select gamified trainings that are similar. And that means studies that have universal mechanics like points, badges, and leaderboards. So they end up specifically excluding anything custom like a simulation. A flight simulator will teach you to fly, but it's very different from a cooking simulator, and so those will get excluded because they just don't pull nicely together. So they end up selecting only the least effective game mechanics, and then they make a generalized statement about all of gamification, including simulations simulations on that basis. That's why whenever somebody comments on one of these videos and says, do you have any studies to back up what you're saying? I feel very comfortable now saying, no, I'm just sharing what I've seen working in 10 years of making gamified training and 10 years before that making video games. So when you come across a study of gamification, you should really pay attention to two things. What type of gamification are they looking at and what outcomes are they measuring? You want to look for improved learning outcomes, not just surveys of learner satisfaction. Number three, relevance is key to engagement. Of course, if you want your gamified training to actually work, the game mechanic you use has to be relevant to your learning goal. So relevance leads to effective training. That makes sense. But what's surprising is that relevance is also the key to emotionally engaging your learners. Nothing engages people more than when they can feel themselves getting better at something. They feel clever and they just want to do more. So what engages learners is the process of learning itself when it's done right. You have to gamify the way you teach and evaluate the learner not just add rewards on top of a standard course. But number four, making training games requires a very specific process. When I was in the games industry, fun was our goal. So if we started out making a shooter, but then we found it's actually really fun to drive around in the vehicles, then we could just drop the shooting and just make a driving game. We could follow the fun wherever we found it because fun was what we were chasing. But when you're making a game for training, your job is to change behavior in a very specific measurable way. So you can't just follow whatever fun idea you get in a way that makes it easier because constraints will narrow your focus down. It's also faster because you're moving straight to a clear measurable goal. You don't need that period of exploration and trial and error to find the fun. It's much more about designing a very specific custom game for your learning objectives. And to do that well, I had to come up with a totally hybrid system that uses games to chase a learning objective, not fun. And if you want to learn that process, that's what my program is about. Number five, gamification is a bad word. 
not because there's a stigma attached to it, although that is sometimes the case, but more because if you stand in front of a thousand people and you say gamification, there's going to be a thousand different ideas and a thousand different heads about what you mean. People constantly get into debates about gamification versus game-based learning, and I try not to get into it because Honestly, who cares? What matters is whether we're succeeding in changing behavior to solve real problems. If you can do that, I don't care what you call it. So you don't have to avoid the word gamification, but don't rely on it either. If you want to stay out of trouble, always be a lot more specific than just saying gamification. So if you're building a gardening simulator, say that, or better yet, show it. That way you're not going to have to overcome whatever idea pops into your stakeholders head when they hear gamification because I promise you what they're thinking is probably not what you're envisioning. Number six, clients know what they want. Your job is to know what they need. One of my first mistakes when I started out was that I had this great portfolio of possible games that I could develop and clients would look at those games, fall in love with one of them and decide to hire me to make that specific game for their content. And of course I would agree to that because I wanted the contract. But that was a mistake because sometimes their content just didn't fit the type of game they had chosen. And with time I realized that the best way to serve my client is to let them know exactly the game that's going to help their learners reach their goals and solve their problem. So you have to push for what the client needs. It can be challenging to change their minds, but the clearer you are about why this is the best design to create real world impact, the more confident you're going to be and it gets way easier to get by in that way. Number seven, experience trumps certifications. When I started out, I was stressed out about the fact that I didn't have a specific instructional design certificate or a master's degree, and I worried that I couldn't compete on the market, but I'm actually refusing several clients every month. Think about it. The typical job posting has all these criteria that the candidate has to fulfill, so all the potential candidates go after the same certifications. So the hiring manager ends up with a bunch of candidates that all pretty much look the same on paper. In that context, offering something different actually turned out to be a strength, not a liability. It's a really good idea to invest in actually making training programs and building your experience because you'll not only get a portfolio, but you'll also have stories to tell at an interview, problems you've had to overcome and solutions that you found. When I hire people, that's what I look at. I'm way more interested in the real problems you can solve for me than what pieces of paper you collected by studying theory. And I know that a lot of jobs out there demand these pieces of paper and that's fair enough, but I'm just telling you that I've been able to do really well by not going for the job postings where the feeding frenzy is, but instead contacting managers directly and emphasizing what makes me different. That way you can absolutely bypass the whole ticking the box system. Number eight, generalizations about learners are dangerous. A lot of instructional design models and even gamification methods will make you develop a learner persona, a portrait of your typical learner so that you can design for them. I'm not against that. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but I know from speaking to a lot of you that you don't always have access to the learners or to enough learners to get a representative picture. And some of you make training that's going to be seen by thousands of people all over the world that you'll never meet. So getting blocked at this idea of developing a learner persona can cause stress that you don't need. My clients often say, our learners are salespeople and you know, salespeople are competitive so we need to have a competition. Or they're cardiologists and cardiologists take themselves seriously so everything needs to be super heavy and ponderous. But the truth is those generalizations are too broad. Most learner groups are going to have people who are motivated by different things so you're better off layering in a couple of motivational mechanics so that the same program can please your competitors, your collectors, and your explorers. Plus the same person isn't always motivated by the same thing. Moods change. You might get tired of competing with others and you just want to explore for a while. So don't get stuck on this idea that you absolutely have to develop a learner persona. If you don't have great access to a lot of learners, don't worry about it too much. It's not a make or break thing. Just layer in a couple of those motivational mechanics so that different learners will have different ways of approaching your content. Number nine, Knowing what to build is way more important than knowing how to build it. A lot of people ask me what tool they should acquire and learn to make gamified training. And yes, you do need a tool to build prototypes, but that's not your biggest challenge. If I wanted to be a successful novelist, my biggest challenge wouldn't be figuring out how to use Microsoft Word. I could be great at using Microsoft Word, but that won't make me John Grisham. Your most important challenge is to figure out what you should build for your learning objectives. Once you have that, figuring out how to actually make it work in storyline or captivate is easy. And there's a lot of places online where you can get help with that part. And finally, number 10, 
If everyone agrees with you, you're doing it wrong. This last one is something I've picked up in the last three years because I've been putting myself out there a lot more here on YouTube and also on LinkedIn. When I started this channel, I expected people to be rude or insulting because we keep hearing that people turn into total trolls when they get online. But people turned out to be a lot nicer than what I'd feared and rudeness has not been a problem. So good on ya, internet. I also used to worry a lot about taking controversial positions here about instructional design, but I kind of realized that if if I say something that everyone agrees with, then I'm just stating what people already know and I'm not contributing anything new or helpful. Of course, sometimes people disagree and it's clear that they haven't watched the video or read the piece or I happen to trigger some specific allergy they have, like drag and drop, in which case I say, okay, thanks. But when they do disagree for real, then I am bringing something new and they are illuminating my blind spots or areas where I need to sharpen my arguments because I'm just not as clear as I should be. So I've come to see this disagreement as a sign of health. So thank you so much for watching and for all your thoughtful comments. Check out the program in the description and here's to the next 10 years.